I was one of the few people at the business school that went down to Wall Street in 1950 when we graduated. And I started dealing with clients, etc. And the more I dealt with various people, I started to hear about Warren. And Bill Ruane, who was in the class before me, was a very good friend. And Rick Kniff, his partner, was in my class and a good friend of mine. So we had lunch one day, and it was probably early in, in the 60s, early. And he said to me, you know, you buy the same stocks as a friend of mine, Warren Buffett, who I met at Columbia. You got to meet him. So Bill arranged a lunch with Warren, and that was my first exposure. And then coincidentally, I would guess within the month or maybe a couple weeks later, maybe a couple weeks after that, a client of mine up in Westport, who was, I think, dealing with Warren on the sale of Warren's company at the time, or it was not his company, it was Dempster actually, I think, said to me, this guy is coming up and he's the brightest guy we've met. And uh, Let's play. Go let's all play golf together. So I went up. My, I played golf up in Westport with Warren. So from then on, it was a complete romance. But you know, he's a very competitive guy. And Warren and I used to play golf in a twosome or in a foursome, and we would always, if we hit the ball straight out. I would guess that we were within four feet of each other when the ball landed. But uh, he was a heck of a competitor. And I would say, you know, Warren didn't overdo golf. And uh, so I'm sure he could have gotten it well into the 70s. But he, he was probably around at 90 or so. That's where I was. I mean, one of the reasons that we were, we became very close friends at the time was that Susie met my wife. And she loved my wife, and my wife, lo she was a very lovable person. And so there's no doubt about the fact that, I mean, Warren told me the same story, only he told it to me 50 years ago, maybe more than 50 years ago. Uh, he was very indebted to Susie, and uh, he loved her deeply. Everybody's got a certain amount of personality and charm in that family. I mean, Howie is terrific, and Susie's great. And uh, I'm not so sure it wasn't in the genes to begin with. I didn't know his father, but uh, he had enormous love and respect for his father. And his father must have been a very charismatic guy because he was in Washington, you know, as a representative for a number of terms. I missed it at first, but it came through very strongly. And uh, I think he was very afraid of his mother. She lived up the street, and I think I only met her once. And I used to go out to Omaha, and I wondered, you know, I, I, when I first went out there, I stayed at Warren's house because he was very hospitable then, and he didn't know many guys down on Wall Street. But he never talked to her about her. And uh, I learned not to ask any questions. I would think it started around, well, it started right after I, uh, I met Warren, actually. But it wasn't every Sunday night then. It was just occasional. But. Uh, I was very much into stocks in those days, and I was doing a lot of research. And I was doing research on very undervalued stocks. In those days, you know, Warren was doing the same thing, only more so. And there were many decent opportunities at three, four, five, six times earnings and half book value. And, you know, every Sunday night, 
after I worked like hell during the week, I would call Warren with all my best ideas. Warren would sit upstairs in his, I think on the landing where he had his chair and, or a little office there. And uh, I would bring up the name of a company and most of the time he knew much more than I did about the company. He'd know how many shares were outstanding, he'd know the capitalization, he'd know the earnings. It was absolutely incredible. But uh, every idea I had, I batted up to Warren. And uh, it was like getting the good housekeeping seal of approval, particularly if he was going to buy some. And I don't know about Warren, but when we were finished at maybe 11 or 12, I was so stirred up, which I think is something that Warren is capable of doing. I was so stirred up and so excited, I didn't go to sleep for a couple of hours. I thought Warren was a terrific salesman. I mean, when Warren said something, it meant a heck of a lot. And I think all of us paid a lot of attention to Warren when he took a definite stand on something. And, uh, you know, right from the start, Warren knew where he was going. I mean, he wanted to have an outstanding reputation. He wanted to have an, op an out a reputation that he never really upset the apple cart when he bought a business that he kept the management in place, that he, he never sold one of the things he acquired, even though it was a mistake. And so he was establishing a reputation that paid off later in life. And look at the reputation he has today. But that's been building and building ever since I've known him. In the late 60s, Warren was not so interested in stocks anymore. He felt the market was very high, and he was buying less and less, and the partnership had grown considerably. So I don't know whether he mentioned this or not, but I called him up and suggested that he buy something that belonged to my wife's family, or part of it belonged to my wife's family, and it was a department store in Baltimore. And uh, Warren and Charlie flew in because this was a fairly big deal at the time. And uh, it was the number one department store in Baltimore. And just like Warren does, I mean, within 24 hours, he made up his mind that he would, the price was right, and he would buy it, and he liked the people very much. When, the, when he owned the business for about a year, it was a business that really didn't interest him. It was a retail business. It was very competitive. There were three other competitors all on the same opposite corners in the main thoroughfare of downtown Baltimore. And Warren, the, while the department store was profitable, very profitable, it kept expanding and it kept putting money back into branches and into elevators and into furniture stores and into outlying, outlying fur, you know, furniture stores. So he said to me, you know, I like businesses that throw off cash. I don't like businesses that eat a lot of cash. And this business particularly, and I think that's true of a lot of retail businesses, and, the, and that's why there's very few department stores around today, they do require a lot of capital expenditures. So Warren said, why don't you think about selling it? So I did. And Warren had very good relationships with the management. And I think they were all in favor of it. And uh, I mean, they really wanted to please Warren. And I think, I think one of the things about Warren is when he buys a business, people love him. And they, and they try their best to do their very best while he owns this, the operation. So to come back to your point about Dempster, he was not buying the greatest businesses in the world. He was buying difficult businesses that were selling at big discounts. I mean, Dempster made, I think, windmills. 
So how big a market was there for windmills in those days? And uh, I would think that the electric motor and other things have changed the business considerably. But so, I mean, but he bought Dempster very, very cheaply and made a fair amount of money out of it. But uh, it's not characteristic of what he does today. And he learned over the years also. When he bought Berkshire, he, he had become very interested in the insurance business. And because of his interest in Geico, he learned a lot about the insurance business. And he was a very fast learner. And he understood these businesses extremely well. So again, he knew exactly where he was going over the years, but it started out very slowly in Berkshire. Meanwhile, he was interested in making as much money for Berkshire as possible. So occasionally, I would come up with some idea for him, and uh, we would go into it. And uh, whenever he worked, he joined me in anything, or I joined him, it was a great success. It's true that, you know, he had very good friends like Walter Schluss, and that's what they were doing. But I think Warren was well above the cigar butt philosophy in the late 60s and wasn't buying cigar butts because they weren't big enough and he didn't want to waste his time on them. And there were, there were other very reasonably priced securities that we you could buy and do extremely well. And uh, everything that I ever suggested to Warren that interested him, he always made a big contribution that made it more valuable than I even thought about, and faster. <laughs> when Warren lost his wife, he tried to have a composure that was reasonably, you know, composed. But you could see inside he was suffering greatly, and he let it go once in a while. And because uh, we, f I flew out there with a couple friends of Warren's, and we paid a visit, and my wife was along. And you could just see the pain that he was going through. I think he became much more, you know, I could see it towards his kids and towards his family and everything else. He did change over the years, no doubt about it. But I don't, I don't remember a lot of tough things. He was a softy in many respects. He might have been a little tough with the kids once in a while, but that's because he, in the early years, he wasn't really into running the kids. It was Susie that ran the kids. So uh, he was much more aloof than he was later on. But look at the family today. Bill Ruane had just started his firm, and Warren had asked him, because Warren thinks ahead of time all the time, Warren asked him to start a small fund for small investors that would invest the way Bill invested at the time. So Bill started Sequoia Fund, which, of course, has become very, very successful. And all the accounts that were small, let's say under 100000 or so, he would suggest that they go into Sequoia. There were other clients that were larger, and I guess some of those went to Bill and some went to me. And I still have, fortunately, the, the heirs of, some, of one or two of those now. And uh, they've been very good clients. There were very few hedge funds back then. There was A.W. Jones, there was Steinhardt, there were a couple of others. 
And they were, well, there was an interview actually in the paper about this that got one of them in trouble about fancy information. And there was a lot of fancy information being passed around between the brokers and, the, and the, uh, some of the funds and some of the investors. And Warren, I don't think, wanted any part of that. He was not somebody who wanted to get inside information because he was all by himself. And if he had his value line in front of him, he could appraise a company in a very few minutes and very successfully. Well, we had an analyst at the firm who had done a fair amount of work on a company called Home Insurance. And it was selling at around 17 or half, 18, which is almost half book value. And so I sent the report out to Warren that we had. And Warren read it and said, let's start buying it. So, I mean, Warren had much more buying power centralized and uh, than we did and uh, so Warren really bought a substantial piece of this and I bought some of it for clients and we were paying an average of 18 19 dollars a share for quite a while and after Warren got to 10 percent in Berkshire and he had to disclose his holdings he decided maybe it was a good opportunity to sell it. So he suggested to me that I try out somebody in Chicago that he had done business with earlier about a position he had that I wasn't involved in called Lone Star Steel. So I went out there, I spoke to the spoke to them, gave them a report on home insurance, and lo and behold, they loved the idea, even though there were, this was a, an old railroad holding company, and they made an offer for the stock we had, and we, got, we had some other insurance companies that joined us, or, and they made the offer at 30 bucks a share. But Warren thought the stock was worth substantially more than $30. So when we sold the stock, we made an agreement that if they resold it at a higher price, that we would participate in a good part of the profits. And sure enough, when they tried to move in on home insurance because they had this big block of stock, a million shares, the management didn't want any part of them. And so that's one of the things that was going on in these days. There, were, there was a company called City Investing. It was a high flyer of the first order back then. And they offered up almost $100 a share for home insurance because it had a lot of assets and they were asset light. So uh, they took over. And of course, you know, from a value standpoint, you couldn't compete with people like that. And within a year or two, got into big trouble and, and had to liquidate. But I think that was true of the times. I mean, there was a lot of high flyers out there that were, you know, taking over. The, it's like the conglomerates today. Bidding wars, everything else was going on back then. And I don't think Warren liked that at all. We had another opportunity. Uh, we had a couple, but I must say, in anything that I suggested to Warren, turned out to be much better than what I ever thought. And this was a company called Studebaker, which was going out of the uh, car business. And they had a huge tax loss. So I called up Warren. I told him that we had done work on, on Studebaker. They had started to diversify. They owned a company called Onan, which, was, which is still a well-known manufacturer of uh, generators. They owned another company called STP, which was really the, the most important company they owned, which was the additive to your car to supposedly be good for your engine. 
So STP was an unknown quantity. You couldn't get any information in those days about it, and companies didn't supply that kind of information. But we knew there was a big tax loss in Studebaker, and there was a lot of assets, and uh, it was looked like a very, very cheap stock. So we started to buy it, and Warren dispatched either a friend of his or one of the people in the office, and I, I forget who it was. could have been Bill Scott, but I'm not sure. And they went out to the railroad track outside the factory, which was near Chicago, and they counted the number of railroad cars going into the factory and the number of railroad cars that were coming out of the factory. And that gave Warren and ourselves some idea of the size of STP. And we, we bought quite a bit of stock. And in those days, I was working pretty hard, and I would leave the office and around 7, 8 o'clock at night, and uh, I'd go to Grand Central Station to catch the train. So there was no such thing as quote machines, but I would buy the Herald Tribune, which had an e a morning edition that came out at 9 o'clock at night that had all the prices in it. So I picked, I started to leaf through the paper, and there was a full-page ad by a man in, uh, I think his name was Murphy, in Honolulu, who was in the, uh, in the car business. He was offering $35 a share for the stock that we had been buying between 18 and 20. I liked that price range. So I called up Warren, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night when I got home. I said, Warren, this guy who's a car dealer is, has this full page ad and is making this offer on Studebaker. So Warren said to me, without blinking at all, without hesitating, he said, okay, he says, tomorrow morning, go into the crowd, on, on, it was listed on the stock exchange, and buy everything that, at the opening. Just clean it all up. So that's what we did. <clears throat> and that was the end of that bid, because the stock went up above that. So then question was, what would we do? So a couple of days later, I got a call from somebody I knew out in California, and he was, he was trying to put a deal together, so he offered us 44 bucks for the stock that we had cleaned up at around 35. That was the opening. And uh, they were wild and woolly days back then. So uh, I said, okay, we'll do it. We'll sell it to you. I thought it was a very rich price. So he, who, he didn't have the money, and he didn't have the client. And maybe in the next couple hours, he called up Warren and said, I have this terrific company for sale. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Warren said, I'm the seller. <laughs> so anyhow, he had, we had put the trade up on the New York Stock Exchange, and he was obligated. So. It went through finally. The Black Bank, though, yep. was probably part of Susie's influence. He had a good friend by the name of Nick Newman. And Nick and he, Nick was in a, he had a grocery chain. It was in Omaha and some of the other cities. I forget where, but a very nice guy and a good friend of Warren's, and together they took an active part in helping the black community, and I'm sure that that was Susie's influence. Omaha was a pretty segregated area back then, and uh, Warren belonged to the Omaha Country Club, and uh, his friends, that were Jewish belonged to Happy Hollow. So Warren wanted to break down the barriers at, at the Omaha Country Club, and also there was, I think, a, another club, an eating club downtown for lunches that was also very exclusive. 
So Warren felt the only way he could do it was to apply to the Jewish Country Club for membership. And the Country Club directors had a great deal of trouble with that. On the one hand, they wanted to have Warren as a member. On the other hand, there was a limit to how many members they could have, and they had a waiting list that was all Jewish potential members, and he was taking one of those spots. So there was a real thought process that went into that. And I think that they finally saw what Warren was trying to do, and they pushed it through, and he, he joined that club. Now, I don't know about the other side. I don't know at what point wh whether they ever did open up or not, but uh, I do know about Happy Hollow. Now, I think Warren is free of all prejudice, completely free of it. And if he learned that from his father, I wasn't aware of it, but, I, but he has no prejudice whatsoever. White, yellow, black, doesn't make any difference to him. I'm not sure that I'm 100% right on this, but in those days, salmon was a very, very cheap stock. It was selling for much less than its value, and they had done some things in mergers, et cetera, that affected the value. So I actually discussed Solomon Brothers with him as a potential candidate because it was right there in value line. And uh, I had done some work on it. And Solomon was a pretty good franchise at the time. I mean, they were a top trader. Every, every large block of stock went through Solomon Brothers. And uh, they were a very, very aggressive, successful firm. Warren made up his mind to go ahead and buy this. Buy this. There was a, a block of stock that was available, and he bought that block of stock. And it was a cheap price. But he didn't know at the time anything about what he was getting into as far as, you know, getting into trouble with the government about government bonds. And that came up shortly after he got involved. I don't know to this, I mean, I think Warren was sorry that he got involved, but Warren and Charlie went on the board, and Charlie couldn't stand what was going on there and didn't like the culture at all. And uh, I think that, you know, when the thing exploded, Warren had 24 hours or less to make up his mind as whether he was going to go forward or just bow out. And I think at that point, Solomon Brothers could have gone into bankruptcy. And Warren stepped up and took responsibility, which is not so characteristic of, of him. He likes other people to step up and take the responsibility and work things out. But uh, certainly in, in Solomon Brothers, he deserves every bit of praise. And as you know, every year, at the, were you at the annual meeting this year? So he's, they, in that movie, almost every year they show his testimony in front of the uh, committee. So I thought, it, I think in the final analysis, it, it burnished his reputation. But at the time, he was very upset about it. Everybody on Wall Street by that time knew about Warren. Uh, whether investors knew about Warren so much, I never thought about that, and I can't answer that question. Uh, certainly his reputation by that time had really spread, and it was no, no secret. And I'm not so sure he, he certainly didn't have that in mind when he went into Solomon Brothers. I mean, he had an investment and he had a responsibility, and he faced up to it. But I don't think he was looking at it that this would improve his reputation on a national basis.
I just don't think so. Charlie met Warren through a doctor friend. Charlie comes from Omaha, so he met Warren through a friend of his who was a doctor, I think he was a doctor, and an investor in Warren's partnership. And Charlie was starting a small partnership after his career in law out in L.A. because Charlie saw that there was more money in running a partnership than running a law firm. So he started this firm called Mungo Wheeler and & Company. And uh, Charlie was a very, very bright man and a very good lawyer at the time. And he met Warren in about a year before I, a couple years before I met him maybe, and around, probably around 1960 or 59, through this doctor friend. And, you know, same thing. I mean, he met Warren and, and had the same reaction that I did or anybody else does that meets Warren. He says, wow. And I think Warren thought about Charlie in the same way. But I would say Charlie has been a very, very strong anchor for Warren. Uh, when we, we made one investment together in, a, in that store in Baltimore, because Warren invited us each to buy 10%. And from then on, we, we, we were involved in a company called Diversified Retailing until a, a number of years later. And uh, every time Warren wanted to do something, and he would pass it by Charlie and pass it by me, I was 100% in favor of it. <laughs> and Charlie always had a couple of strong reservations. So... I think Charlie has been sort of an anchor man, and uh, he's been very useful to Warren in, uh, in pointing out some of the problems. There was an element of fraud involved in this, this man at Solomon Brothers who had broken the law of the Federal Reserve, I think, on how many bonds you could buy in a government auction. And he had gone way above that, and he had, he took the inventory, and when the bond went up a little bit, he would sell it out and make a f su substantial profit for Solomon Brothers. And they used their capital that way, I think, many times. So when, well, you know the story. I mean, he went to good friend, and said, you know, I got a problem because he had gotten, I guess, a questionnaire from the government. And good friend didn't react the way he should have at the time. He, he didn't say, let's, let's get down there and confess and say, mea culpa, and make a deal. So they, he sort of kept it to himself. And I think when Brady moved in, if it was Brady or the Fed moved in, or the Treasury Department, they were very much at risk of losing their ability to trade governments. It was going to be taken away from them. And uh, I think Warren had to step in in a very short period of time. I mean, it could have been 24 or 48 hours, and he made the decision that he would step in. It certainly redounded to his benefit because he came out very well, but it was a heartbreaking thing for a while. Warren, as an analyst, went down to Washington one weekend, and, I mean, lo and behold, he knocks on the door of this company, and, you know, nobody's there in the office, and finally... Some watchman answers the door and says, what do you want? And Warren says, you know, I'm, I'm a research analyst, and I'd love to interview the, speak to the president. So he, by chance, he was in his office upstairs. And Warren went up to meet him, and he was enthralled by this man. And the man spent the better part of the day talking to Warren about the Geico and what a good business the insurance business was. And, of course, under 
Barnes Aegis years later, Geico became a much, much more important business and uh, really went all out in the mail order business and made it very, very efficient. But what Warren likes about any of those businesses is that he has a fair amount of money that's sitting there, as supposedly as float, and he can use the float to invest in other things. So Geico was making, after it had a very low expense ratio because they were very, very efficient at Geico at the time, and they became even more efficient and the expense ratio was low compared to all the other insurance companies. So they were earning money when it was difficult for other companies to earn money. And in addition, they had this big reservoir of money that was float. Now, the float in the, in the automobile insurance business is not as good as the float at the other companies that he has, but it's substantial, and it adds up into what is a large float of free money that Warren can take to buy businesses and to invest. So it's a twofer. As far as I know, Charlie had a man working for him who had been, I think, a petroleum engineer. And Charlie and Warren were approached on seas and they were going to make an offer that was below what C's wanted. And this man piped up and said, you know, you're doing the wrong thing. This is a high-quality business. It's going to have substantial growth. There's plenty of leeway to raise the price on chocolates, and you really should raise your bid because you're, buy you're not buying an asset. You're buying a name. You're buying a brand. You're buying a real franchise here. So they did raise their bid, and they bought it. And of course, looking back, it was the start of buying good businesses at relatively favorable prices. And Charlie was more responsible for that than anybody. Warren has a, this, I shouldn't say theory, it's a, um, it's not a proverb either, but he, he has this strong feeling, which he communicates to all of us, that if you buy a good business and you stay with it for a long time, you're going to make a fair amount of money. And that's really what, what Berkshire is and what some of the companies that Warren's bought. I mean, he's made a lot of money buying Coca-Cola, even though it's now subject to criticism. He's made a lot of money in American Express doing that. He's made a lot of money in a lot of companies, and I think that all of us learned a lot out of that seize. Probably 1972-73, for some reason, the New York Times went public with a restricted stock, an A and a B, and a whole group of previously privately owned companies also became public. And the stocks all fell down. The market was going down, and these stocks went down. And Washington Post went down substantially from its initial offering price. So Warren started to buy some stock. And I must say, you know, Warren is very good about sharing his thoughts with people and directing them and in various ways, and he had he had talked to a whole group. We, we, I mean, Carol, I'm sure, told you about the group meetings that we had. And he had talked about, you know, uh, the value of broadcasters, the value of newspapers, et cetera. He saw real value and in these newspapers, and also not only the franchise value, but the thrill of being involved in a newspaper like Washington Post. And Kay Graham had some advisors in those days that were on the board that checked Warren out. And here was this young guy that was buying a big piece of Washington Post. 
and they were very, very suspicious about it. I had, my wife and I happened to be out in California. We visited with Warren during the summers then. He had a place in Laguna, and we would go out and we'd play golf, and we'd, we'd go out at night with Susie and occasionally with Charlie, et cetera. And uh, Warren had invited Kay Graham out directly. She was strong enough to say to herself, I'm not going to listen to all my advisors. I want to find out for myself. So she came out to California, and she met him. And I, I, I was there at the time, and this is a story you won't get from many people, but anyhow, Warren started talking to her. And, and you know, when Warren starts to talk, he, he's very convincing, and he can talk for a long time. So she, she looked out the window, and here was this beautiful beach, and beautiful, it was a beautiful uh, U-shaped cove. And she said, I think I'll go for a swim. So she changed into her bathing suit, came downstairs. Warren started the conversation again. We walked down to the beach. I, I was there. We, Warren is fully dressed. He started walking into the water. And Warren doesn't swim, and he doesn't go in the water. And all of a sudden, when he got up to his waist, <laughs> he realized he was in the water. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> and he turned around and, and went out. But uh, he was thrilled by her visit, and I think she was very taken with Warren from then on. So she didn't listen to her advisors at all. My brother threw a small birthday party for me at, at the hotel uptown, and there were probably... 35 or 40 people there, good friends. And Warren and Susie came. Susie sang. And then there were a lot of toasts afterwards. And Warren's toast was, may you live to Berkshire Splits. And that was 30 years ago. And so far, so good. I'm here. Warren hadn't split the stock. So that's made, made a big difference in my life, because I think about that often. <laughs> well, I mean, if Bill Ruane was here, he'd really tell you about it. But, you know, S Susie was interested in singing in front of various groups, and she was, going, she would, she was willing to go to various nights semi-nightclubs in New York and sing there. Maybe it was for the experience or maybe she wanted to do it because she enjoyed it. But anyhow, they would come to New York and Bill would arrange for her to sing at various small little clubs. And we would go and listen to her. But uh, she loved it. And uh, Bill really killed himself setting up those dates for her. And... Uh, I think Warren was very proud. She had a very wonderful voice, yeah, and she had a good scent. She sang the oldies, really, you know, show tunes, that sort of stuff. Warren, like nobody else I know, has had an enormous loyalty to all of us. There's nobody that he's ever turned his back on that I know of. The group that we had Maybe Warren outgrew many of the people in it, uh, but he never abandoned anybody, and he always inclusive, and he was very, very loyal. We had a group of eight of us that would go out to the West Coast and play golf at Pebble and three other golf clubs over a four-day period, and Warren was getting busier and busier and busier, but yet every year. Every two years, he would show up, and he would play golf for four days, even though it wasn't his greatest interest in the world. And as far as the, the meetings that he had, well, he was meeting all the famous people in the world, and everybody was coming to his doorstep. But he remained very, very loyal to all of his friends, and of course, that group that Carol described to you, 
was composed for the most part of people that he knew starting back in the 60s. So I, I don't know anybody like that, that, you know, he could, he could get down to the president's home any time he wanted to. And in fact, there's some great stories. He, he was invited out to Ray, he was invited out with Reagan to Walter Annenberg's home in uh, Palm Springs. Walter Annenberg had this f house that was a fairly well-known house, evidently. It's now an institution. Right. But uh, he would invite various people down for weekends. And, you know, Warren was getting to be very big in the newspaper business, and he was a great investor. And so Walter wanted to cultivate Warren. So he invited him out when he had Reagan, who was then president, for the weekend. And Warren went out there. And there were other people out there, too. And it Everybody had their own room, and they had attendants that were helping them, you know, unpack and pack. And it, it was it was all very, Im very, very uh, impressive and luxurious. So Walter had a nine-hole golf course that he played as eighteen holes, and every single ball on the range or, that they used was a brand new ball. It was never hit twice; just one trip on a ball. So. Annenberg, with all of his friends, said to his friends who were there, golfers, saying, I've reserved starting times for you across the street at one of the courses. I forget the name of it. Could have been Thunderbird or one of those. He says, it's too crowded over here. So Walter and Reagan and Warren went out to play golf on this golf course. They were the only ones. But it was kind of cute that they, he sent everybody across the street, said it's too crowded. But uh, so Warren had some good stories about his various things. And I mean, Warren could go any place he wanted to by that time, but he was extremely loyal to every one of his friends. We never bought Berkshire directly. We got our stock through Diversified the same way as Charlie got most of his stock. And I don't know of a better investment for my children and my grandchildren and maybe a couple people that come after it than Berkshire as long as the culture remains the same. And that's the most important thing. And I know that the people who are coming along and that we're thinking about as potential replacements for Warren someday have a very strong sense of culture and have a very strong sense of obligation to Warren and everything Warren stands for. So I have no doubt that, you know, for 25 years afterwards, the culture isn't going to change. And meanwhile, you own a group of companies that are extraordinary. And uh, maybe, maybe uh, new management will do a few things that Warren might not have done but otherwise, they're going to be very strong, value-oriented people and uh, very decent, decent, honest individuals. You know, any time Warren says something, you can take it to the bank. And I think people understand that. And, uh, but, but I think Berkshire really stands for culture is complete decency and honesty, yes. There was a time before Warren made his big gifts to the Gates Foundation that he was getting criticized. And you can see it in the blogs that were written back then and some of the letters and other things that here was this very, very rich man who was getting richer every year and really wasn't giving a lot of money away. And there was terrific criticism by some people, which Warren never said anything about and didn't answer. But all along, people were getting very rich on owning Berkshire, particularly those people who were started out in the early days with a few dollars in his partnership. And I mean, there were in, there's still instances of where you've got this man in, who died 
a couple of years ago in Brooklyn who came from, uh, he was a professor at Brooklyn, I think, Polytechnic, and he left a fortune of seven, eight hundred million dollars. Nobody ever heard of him before, but he had been a partner of the, uh, of the original partnership, put a few dollars in, and, you know, had given most of it away. He didn't have any children. And there was a, there was actually a rabbi in, in, uh, in Omaha. It was a great story. Uh, his name was Kripke. And his wife met Susie because his wife was drawing children's books. And Susie met her because she was interested in the, in the books. And so she called up and she met her. And then she thought she was charming. And so they started playing bridge at night with once a month or once every couple of weeks with the rabbi and his wife. And they had a very strong friendship. And the, the wife said, to, Warren was young and running the partnership. Warren said to the rabbi, I mean, his wife said to the rabbi, you really should put some money into the Warren's partnership because, you know, his brilliance always shone through. And the rabbi was very reluctant because this was his retirement fund. But finally, he did put some money in, a very small amount. And when he retired, he had a few, I think he had a, a son. I don't know who else he had. I think he's still alive in that. He's in an old age home in, in uh, Omaha. But he had given, nobody thought he had, he, I, he, I don't think he ever made more than fifteen or $16,000 a year as a salary. But he gave something like thirty or forty million dollars to the seminary in New York for a brand new entrance hall and research facility, I think. And nobody ever heard of him before. And these people are all popping up all over. And I heard a story about somebody the other night who made a, a large gift. Uh, somebody who really was quite poor and, and had come over. They were a Holocaust victim. They had put a few bucks into Warren's partnership, and uh, they gave hundreds of millions of dollars to some university. And you, you hear about it all the time where I know in, in my case, I mean, I thank Warren all the time because I, well, I don't give away the Berkshire. That's sort of sacrosanct, but uh, it's made it possible for me to make a fair amount of major gifts that have brought joy to the whole family. So I think it, it, you know, Warren's influence on giving things away and charity has been a real leadership position, and people just don't appreciate it that much. And you know, they, I think what he's done with his children is, is terrific. I mean, you, and, you spoke to Howie and you spoke to some of those. They've all thrived because they're running these foundations and are able to give away money. And, uh, I mean, Warren's influence is strong, and he spends his time the way he really, you know, he's got only so much time, and he spends his time very carefully. But he, he feels that he has delegated Gates as the best person possible to run a lot of his charitable activities, and I think he's correct. But... Uh, the amount of money that he's made for other people because of Berkshire is extraordinary, and all that money is being given away over the years. And all those remarks about him years ago are just absolutely incorrect. I did not realize the severity of it at, when it started. I was in Omaha for a meeting, and Warren was getting calls left and right from various companies that were need, you know, that had a lot of leverage and needed funds. And in those days, he would had the opportunity to buy extremely high-yielding preferred stocks that were convertible or had warrants in some very good companies like Goldman Sachs and a host of other companies that made a lot of money for Berkshire in the long run. But I think that the severity of that, 
decline at the time and the crisis and the what's happened with housing ever since and the effect on employment was not I, I didn't see it coming as strongly as it came and it turned out to be one of the most serious events we've had outside of the Depression in 29. And uh, I think Warren and Charlie both handle themselves extremely well. Warren always has this wonderful view that you get greedy when other people are, you know, fearful, and you get fearful when other people are greedy. And certainly, he used that opportunity to build the build Berkshire. And of course, Berkshire is a fortress. It's impregnable as far as the financial condition. But I think the, co the country was in serious trouble. And I mean, I'm not an expert economist, but this the fact that interest rates have been coming down and down, in fact, there are almost no, nothing now, is still a reflection of the unemployment and the housing and all the things that are the aftermath of what happened back then. Incidentally, Warren has a great expression about macro, people that you know have a real macro feeling. And I've never forgotten it. He says there's a place in the cemetery that's reserved for all those people that think they can see what's going to happen in the market. Well, I think his message has always been very optimistic about the United States and the place of the United States in the world and the place that you really should have your money because the United States is growing and things are so good here in spite of all the problems and everything else. And I think he, he fundamentally believes it like nobody else that I know. So he's a strong believer and he's a strong salesman on that. In so many ways, Warren has been an enormous influence on me and on our family. And for example, even though the family, some of the family doesn't care about business at all, they all have made the trek to Omaha. They all know Warren. They all think the world of Omaha, of, of Warren. They have tremendous respect for him and his values. I use some of Warren's material, I send it to the kids so that they can read what he has to say about, you know, about life. And I think he's had an enormous influence on my life and my wife's life. He's made it much more enjoyable. We've loved some of the friends we've made because Warren has, one thing that Warren does is he brings everybody together and he shares everybody. He didn't keep anything to himself. So all of Warren's friends, you know, I got to meet early in the game, and Murphy and Burke and all these other people that we know fairly well, the Loomises, et cetera, all came out of being involved with Warren. So it's been a wonderful experience. It hasn't hurt me from a business standpoint either. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's very nice. There's... I mean, I, I'm very careful about the way I handle myself and uh, not to, you know, impose on any of Warren's reputation, but still in all, it, it rubs off. Warren doesn't forget, forget anything he ever says. And, uh, you know, Warren's gone way beyond anything that I can handle. But when we sold Diversified, I was a vice chairman, and, and Charlie was a vice chairman, primarily because of our ownership. And uh, Warren said to me, look, come to Berkshire. You can become a, a vice chairman just like Charlie, and we're happy to have you. But he said there is a conflict. If you, if you stay in the money management business and you're going to be buying these stocks, you're going to have to report everything you buy, and I'm going to have to report everything I buy, and they're going to com combine them, and it's going to be a problem. So I said, that's fine, Warren. I don't need that. 
So he said, if you ever get in a position where you're out of First Manhattan, my offer stands. So after Susie passed away, which is now well over 10 years ago, I guess, I think the world changed as far as Warren was concerned. And again, loyalty was, has been very important and integrity again. And so Warren came, there was an opening on the board and Warren came to me and said, would you like to be on the board now? So I said, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna jump at this opportunity, but let me think about it overnight. So Warren said to me, you know, he said, you've been a very private person and the minute you go on the board, you're gonna to have to start reporting. So by that time, I had given away some of my Berkshire to the family, and uh, I thought about it, and I felt that the advantages of being on the board versus you know, not being on the board were substantial, and I said, great. So th that's another example of his great loyalty. Oh, look, there must be 30 books out about Warren right now. And Warren's influence on the, in, on the investment world has been unbelievable. Certainly, he deserves much more credit, I think, than, than Ben Graham. Uh, although Ben Graham has been idolized because, to some extent, Warren has pushed that. But I think Warren's influence is far greater today. And I think for a long, long time, that influence in the financial area is going to be felt. I'm not so sure that, you know, any gifts he makes or any gifts that the kids make are going to, he's not a, he's not a guy who wants to put his name on a lot of things. And he's not somebody who, you know, wants to create institutions in his image. So there isn't going to be anything like that or at least it doesn't look like it right now. So I think he's gonna, you know, there's a whole generation of people who have grown up and they've gotten to know Juan, either going to the meetings, watching him on CNBC, or just going to the sessions that he, he invites these 10 or 12 colleges out there every year and he talks to them. And he, he's really in the teaching business. He may be in the investment business, but he's also in the teaching business. And he shares his, his shares his advice with all these big executives that go into these companies. When Immelt became head of GE, I would say the first thing Immelt did was fly to Omaha and talk to Warren. And I think that goes on all the time. And uh, Warren gives him great advice. So, from a standpoint of naming a university or a big charity after him. I don't know that anything like that's going to happen. Of course, it's up to the children to some extent, but or maybe Bill Gates, who loves him, absolutely loves him. So, uh, but I'm sure some kind of a, an important thing may be done.